However, today's Australian Airport Association webinar. Today's topic is a spotlight on regional airport safety. We are pleased to welcome our presenter for today, Nathaniel Thomas. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to participate by posting questions to the presenter, which can be typed into the chat box at the bottom left corner of your screen. All questions will be answered during the presentation. If you are experiencing any difficulty during the webinar, please dial the 1-800 support number listed in the chat box. I'll hand over to Nathaniel to begin. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's uh, putting the effort to attend today. Thank you very much for giving over your time. Uh, I'll be doing a bit of a talk on regional airport safety and a bit of a different point of view that I've gathered, gathered over the years from uh, travelling around airports. So uh, during this talk, please feel free to ask questions at any time within the chat box. Uh, it's open for everyone to see the questions and if people commence a dialogue between each other, that's all well and good. And I'll uh, answer questions where deemed relevant. Thank you. Uh, a little bit about myself so you know who you're talking to. I work with Aerodrome Management Services. I typically spend a lot of my time carrying out technical and safety inspections around the country, mainly in WA in the Northern Territory. Uh, I've recently spent a fair bit of time on the MOS and CASA 139 Technical Working Group uh, to prepare for the new standards which will come out when they are ready. Um, I carried out a wide range of works airside from uh, digging holes getting dirty as by the picture to uh, managing airports which has been quite a bit of fun. Also been a director at the AAA since 2013 for small regional airports and I'm also responsible for the management of Halls Creek and several other aerodromes. And the key point is I have nil experience whatsoever with webinars so I apologise in advance if I do slightly go to the death by PowerPoint which I'm hoping to avoid. So first up, why safety at aerodromes? Um, Safety, obviously we don't want to hurt people, which is always a good thing. Um, the key risks are to aircraft and workers at the aerodromes. And the other issue is it's a bit embarrassing when your airport makes the news. Um, had that in the past due to a non-aerodrome incident, but still a lot of people do call up and want to have an explanation of why did this happen or why did that happen. And fortunately the incidents uh, have been out of my control when they have occurred. So from safety, everyone would have heard about a safety management system. So currently if you're a certified airport, you're required to have a SMS. Um, most people have the viewpoint of it's just something that you have to do. You put it on the shelf, you collect dust on it, CASA told you to do it. Uh, Paperwork is, and administration is a good way to give a lip service to safety and everyone appreciates paperwork because, well, paperwork just generates more jobs, I believe, for the admin staff and it gives management a good fluffy, warm, fuzzy feeling that they can write about safety. Uh, the other alternative reason to have a, a safety management system would be to share safety information develop and grow the safety culture, um, ID safety trends. So if you see a trend in wildlife, for instance, or an ongoing trend of uh, erosion in some part of the aerodrome, hopefully your safety management system will be able to pick up on that. And it also tracks issues. So in using an aerodrome manual and the supporting systems for that with issues at aerodromes, typically it will uh, note that there's an issue and then it will rectify the issue, hopefully, but there will be no way of foreseeing that issue within the aerodrome manual document set of occurring again. So it does give the opportunity to track an issue. So what is a safety management system? It comprises of four main components, safety policy, safety assurance, safety risk management, and safety promotion. So as a basic summary of these areas. The safety policy uh, does give management accountability. So it is one of those fluffy, warm, fuzzy statements which a large company or even small companies 
we'll put up on the wall of a crib room and it will have words to the effect of we want to ensure a safe workplace for all. And whilst a lot of people do deem these as light fluffy comments, there is a lot of bearing in these comments. So you can hold the management to account if they are not providing what they say what they will provide. Uh, I've sat through many, many mining inductions and they're all very much on the, these statements and they do use those statements throughout their working day and life. So if there is an issue, an employee at many of these sites are able to put their hand up and say, well, we're going outside the guidelines that you've presented to us. And that's when everyone steps back, takes a look at the situation, reassesses and manages to get the job done. Then there's safety assurance. So this is a tracking system. Uh, many issues that do occur at aerodromes are not successfully tracked. So it does fall back to the someone goes out, carries out an inspection, and then either the result of the inspection goes into a file and gets forgotten about, or it's resolved once and then can easily reoccur. So the safety assurance is not there as it is not tracked. The safety risk management is a table where people do just wander around the airport and they make up a list of things that they believe can be hazards. So they may not really be hazards, but until they're assessed to note themselves as hazards, they cannot be addressed. So for instance, you're walking around and there's a hole, might not be airside, it might be landside, that should get noted down and uh, it may be a trip hazard if it's land side and if it's air side it may be a runway strip issue or a runway issue but until the issue is risk well, assessed through the safety risk management process um, there's no way to account for it with uh, good tracking and the final section is safety promotion so it is promoting a very safe culture within the aerodrome and this will enable the training to be discovered of what training requirements there are and also it will uh, make note of changes at the aerodrome. So the typical safety management system is broken into 12 elements but CASA have decided that there's three additional elements being the SMS impl implementation plan, the third party interface for contractors and service providers and the internal safety investigation. By having these extra sections within the SMS, that does enable the SMS obviously to be in implemented. The third party interface allows it to account for all parties within the aerodrome site and the internal safety investigation allows, that, well, allows for incidents and issues to be reviewed and uh, investigated once they've occurred. Um, as you can see on this slide, I won't go through every section. It is broken down into the four sections with subheadings below there. So, whilst it does sound like an administrative nightmare, why this is so important is because it does give the management accountability for the words they give. Uh, and it is always important for the employee to hold the employer accountable to the safety management system. And it also enables the employer to look after themselves. So if there's an issue that they're not happy about and the management aren't giving it the due diligence they should, there is a sufficient reporting system for the aerodrome reporting officer or other, other staff to note it down and it is sufficiently tracked and recorded. And then should something occur, there will be hopefully uh, something to cover the aerodrome reporting officer so they don't uh, get in trouble for their actions. So can anyone type in where the SMS fits within their document tree? So we've got one note of the uh, document is across the entire tree. Are there any other examples, please? Overarching, well, there's some very responsible people out there, which is always good to see.
most small regional airports that I've carried out inspections at, they tend to have the safety management system sitting off to the side of their document set. So the way it's been implemented in the past is an airport will have an aerodrome manual. Within that, or to the side of that, there'll be the aerodrome emergency plan. Then if deemed necessary, there'll be the wildlife hazard management plan, which is once again linked to the aerodrome manual. And then there's the TSP, which sort of sits on a shelf in its own little world because it is, whilst it is related to the aerodrome, it is not necessarily related to the taking off and landing of aircraft. The safety management system should be at the top of the tree. So by reviewing all the content within the aerodrome manual through the procedures in a safety management system, it will enable you to have sufficient outcomes to ensure the safe continued operation of the aerodrome. And for the new section of MOS 139 when it comes out, the SMS will be a key document and CASA will be giving a template for the SMS and also a template for the SMS which is entwined into the aerodrome manual to get the documents closer together to enable closer communications. So the major documents that everyone has at the aerodrome are typically the aerodrome manual, an emergency plan. Um, from reviewing these, a lot of airports in a small regional sense will get them out once or twice a year. Uh, the once will be for when a technical inspector comes to look at them. And the twice may be if there's a CASA audit being carried out. Sadly, the documents don't get used as much as they should. Uh, but I take it from the fact that you're all joining into a webinar that you're all responsible airport operators. And another common document is a wildlife, wildlife hazard management plan. And this is only required if you've determined that there is a threat level uh, of wildlife enough to warrant having a wildlife hazard management plan. Once again, there are many airports which haven't followed their aerodrome manuals procedures and therefore they haven't discovered they've got a threat level at their airport so they don't have a wildlife hazard management plan. So the basics of the aerodrome manual, are the admin, which is the, the people and personnel, the site conditions being the general location, lease conditions, lighting and electrical, which is the electrical and the lighting, serviceability and works, which is generally covered off by your ARO, technical inspections, which cover once again the electrical pavements and uh, aerodrome manual review. These are typically carried out by an outside party. Uh, airside access and airside driving are quite often linked together. Parking control is quite often a section of the aerodrome manual largely forgotten, which says we shall park aircraft and say what kind it is. And this is very frequently overlooked when change management occurs or therefore doesn't occur, um, as that's a uh, high potential for aircraft to collide on aprons if you've changed them without correct assessment. And then there's the protection of nav aids and low visibility operations which will not have too much of an effect on most small aerodromes. So within the wildlife hazard management section of a manual you should be able to uh, have a tracking which is of wildlife which is quite often carried out during the daily serviceability inspection for AROs to know what bird life or activity is occurring at the airport. Uh, one of the challenges in wildlife hazard identification is the ARO will typically do the inspection at a set time of day, which may not be when the threatening species is flying around at the aerodrome. Um, and I believe they are plover eggs on that runway. And if anyone has any good ideas on how to get rid of that issue, please let me know. Short of just picking the eggs up and taking them off the runway. Once the wildlife hazard management plan has been enacted, uh, there may be several different scenarios of how to manage the wildlife hazard. So that can typically range from just keeping the grass cut low, which is found to be very effective in many places, to netting over watercourses, 
removing sections of a particular food type of tree. Um, and depending on how far outside the airplane or aerodrome boundary that you wish to go, which is typically noted as 13 kilometres, um, depends on how much influence your wildlife hazard management plan can have. Then after your wildlife hazard management plan, there's always the emergency plan at an aerodrome. And most people are familiar with that because it's a requirement. Um, when we transition to the new standards, it's highly likely that the emergency plan will be somewhat minimised for small regional aerodromes. Um, there will still be required to be one. It will be very site specific and will be focused more on the aerodrome itself as opposed to the incident happening at the aerodrome. And this will be to the extent with emergency exercises, they will no longer be required as CASA has recognised that there are issues resourcing emergency exercises with volunteers and uh, small populations at some centres. So there'll be, whilst there won't be a requirement for the emergency exercise, there will be a requirement to have a guided tour, well, a strongly recommended requirement for a guided tour of the aerodrome so that all emergency staff are familiar with the surroundings. A commonly missed issue at aerodromes at the moment is a review of the aerodrome emergency plan. So they're currently required to be reviewed once per year and that's infrequently done. So to link many of these issues together, or elements of the aerodrome manual and document set, is the aerodrome reporting officer. They're the ones that are out there doing the job every day, inspecting the airport, finding the issues, dealing with the issues, and hopefully documenting the issues. One of the large problems that aerodrome reporting officers tend to have is isolation and lack of understanding from their management. So if they find an issue, they say they want money to resolve the issue and there's a lack of understanding from the management to fully resolve the issue because not so much a lack of care, but it's just that so far disassociated with a particular manager's skill set that it's easier not to know about it. So one of the first rules for an aerodrome reporting officer is cover your ass. And the way that you do that is you write everything down, you write it down and you write it down again. So when you break down the pure element of an ARO, it is to go look and report. So by the serviceability inspection, you go out, you drive around for your half hour or so, find any issues, note it down, and then report it into the system. If there are no TAMs required, it's up to the aerodrome reporting officer to issue those no TAMs. But if there are minor issues which aren't really needed to have an OTAM, then the issue should still be resolved and documented through other means. Through lack of reporting, there has been some very common problems that I've found. So a, a typical one will be a small issue, um, such as a, a cone which is there, which has been nice and flattened. Uh, the ARO will might note it down on the checklist and they think, oh, I've noted that down. They'll go back to their office or the ARO hut, put the bit of paper into their file. Great, job done. Then the next day the ARO will go down and think, oh gee, I, I noted that that cone was broken yesterday. So see, I, I don't think I really need to note that down because the management didn't do anything about it yesterday. So why would they do anything to, about it today? Um, in reviewing a lot of serviceability inspections, there are quite often issues that crop up once, there's no uh, record of them being addressed and you go airside and the issues are still there. Another issue is ones that do not immediately impact safety. A good example is fading line markings. So it's very hard to say one day, yes, the line markings are acceptable and fine and the next day they're faded and need repainting because it's such a gradual process. In the instance of this aerodrome, uh, the AROs had verbally told the management that there are issues 
and they thought, yep, we've done our job. It's not a, not a safety issue as yet. Management's been told verbally, so the line marking should be repainted. And then after a while, they faded a bit more and the airline decided to not fly in, well, threatened to not fly in until the markings were made visible again. So the management were upset because they were told in passing uh, that there was an issue. They didn't really think it was that much of an issue because they were only told verbally in passing because a real issue gets documented. So the AROs believed they were doing the right thing by not making an issue of it, but uh, as it wasn't correctly documented within the system, uh, a non-compliance occurred and the airline threatened to stop flying in. Another kind of issue is ones where the ARO is worried that the airport might get closed should the um, unserviceability be noted. So uh, there is always the risk with some issues, uh, some are larger than others and quite often once again falling back to the mindset example where the ARO does have the responsibility of telling a whole lot of people they either go home or they don't. That's not necessarily the responsibility that the person wants or is paid for but that's what they get. So to not take on that responsibility they don't note the issues and once again it doesn't get fixed until an inspection or audit takes place and then it's a major issue. Um, Another common scenario is line markings on an apron. So this applies to all airports where you're getting a particular kind of aircraft in. Um, an aircraft operator, say, well, if you have a, a Fokker 100 and go to a Fokker 70, uh, they'll consider that the Fokker 70 is smaller being a shorter aircraft than the Fokker 100 and therefore it won't pose any issues on the apron maneuverability. As it happens, when the Fokker 70 does turn around on a line, the wingtip hangs out further than if a Fokker 100 followed the same line. So therefore it is a more critical aircraft on the apron movement. Um, and I think this resulted in a wingtip going to within about one metre of a light pole in one instance when we measured it out. Um, other examples of this are a, a 737-700 versus a 737-800. And there are also instances where a Metro 23 can be more critical than a Fokker 100. And some of the causes of this are short wheelbase and as opposed to long wheelbases are the, the main issues. So when these issues occur, it's because change management hasn't occurred. Uh, they haven't reviewed the aerodrome manual and the parking section. And there's no real trigger except for reading each section individually. Even more issues. So pilots are uh, always the cause of an issue because if you don't have air aircraft at an airport there won't be any problems. Uh, quite often at lesser airports the pilot seems to have enough authority over some of the lesser experienced personnel and they'll be able to tell the personnel I'm going to park my aircraft there. Um, in this instance it's in the transitional surface. I have seen them parked in the runway strips and all sorts of horrible places and the excuse from the staff on the ground was oh the, the pilot said it was okay. Um, I could go on all day about this um, because there's lots of instances of uh, small issues and I've tried to get uh, a lot of photos where you can't tell where it is. Um, whilst these are issues, most people fall back on the let's tick the box and say training's the issue. Um, I don't believe that's the issue uh, with many of these cases. Most of them are cultural within the organisation and the safety culture should be presented through the safety management system and the strong implementation of a safety management system. Uh, because one of the issues is uh, a young person or sorry, an inexperienced RO will head out fresh from training and old mate who's been there forever will say, oh yeah, that's not an issue. We don't do it that way in the training. This is the real world. Training's not the real world. So it does make it a a cultural issue, not a training issue. So most of the AROs will not have read the document set in the entirety um, and usually there's a poor linkage between the document sets. So if there was a clear, concise 
step-by-step -step process that linked the aerodrome manual and the safety management system, the overarching statements within the SMS will flow through the entire organisation. And once again, information does not readily flow between the document sets. So the solution, we communicate, we record everything, we communicate, we repeat, we communicate. By communicating, it's not necessarily by calling someone up and talking to them, it's documented communication through the correct processes, procedures and channels. So when a serviceability inspection is carried out and there's an issue, it should be documented. Usually it will first up be documented on the serviceability inspection, but quite often it will be documented there and then put into a file. Um, quite often it will be reviewed once a month by the management because they'll go, oh, I'll look at that later on. And so many minor issues aren't resolved until a month or so later and then add in the lead time to get whatever uh, devices might be needed to fix it. So there's a lag time there. And then the management has to talk back to the ARO to say, well, this is how we're going to fix it, and this is how, or maybe how you're going to fix it. So what's really needed is a trigger for when an issue occurs on a serviceability inspection, is everything is reviewed immediately. And there'll be a hierarchy of review where that is it something the ARO can rectify immediately, yes or no? If it's a yes, then they'll note down in their works journal on how the issue is rectified. If they need more resources or if it's a serious issue, it should be elevated. And then management will get involved with the issue and have it resolved. Either which way, there should be a clear documented linkage between any issue and how it is resolved. And should there be an ongoing issue at the aerodrome, one that can't be fixed easily, a review should be carried out uh, and have it safety assessed and the aerodrome updated to say that yes, there is an issue at the aerodrome. Now it can be practically fixed in a reasonable amount of time. And then it would be up to when the aerodrome gets upgraded next for repairs to occur. Um, other, other benefits are OCH Health and Safety. The Aerodrome Manual doesn't really have any reference to OCH Health and Safety. Uh, just a fun couple of little snippets. If you go through the SDS of the chemicals on an aircraft that are always flying in and out, uh, there are many highly toxic, volatile, cancerous, terrible chemicals there. So should you have a blown hose on an apron, uh, you'll have some terrible issues to uh, clean up with and may be very risky to personal health. Uh, a question from Andrew G. Our airport is small and our main ARO is also an airport coordinator and the most senior subject matter expert. Any advice on the level of oversight non-technical senior managers should have? Uh, that's a, a challenging question because there's no measurable level. Um, one thing that can be done is to request clear, concise uh, reporting. So it doesn't have to be long-winded. It will be for, if, there's, if your senior ARO is presenting you with information that you cannot understand, you'll need an explanation of it. And most ARO should be able to break it, the information about an airport down so it is understandable. So it does link back to the communication going back either way. Um, other issues at airports uh, with OCH Health and Safety, a very common incident is uh, wind socks, changing wind socks where people put a rope on the pole, they break in the middle um, and they drop it, the pole's poorly balanced and then they get nice rope burns on their arms or they've wrapped a rope around their arm and they've dislocated a shoulder. Um, alternatives which people have done to that is tie it onto the bull bar of a car so it doesn't get away from you but uh, as per that picture in the background, if you drive the car away without untying the windsock, you may get a adverse happening. So 
In conclusion, read your safety management system. I know a lot of people haven't. It's, um, it's boring, but it is essential to the safe, accountable operation of an aerodrome. And document issues, review them and document them again if necessary. Uh, are there any questions? I hope this has been informative for everyone and has given a, a different perspective on why it is important to have a safety management system at your aerodrome, even though they, they can be an exciting read at times. And here's some uh, templates, forms and check-ins. Um, and hopefully you'll uh, be at the AAA conference in Brisbane next month. So if anyone can tell me where the locations of any of these photos were taken, I'll uh, buy your bevy. Thank you all very much for your positive feedback. Thank you, Nathaniel, for your presentation, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Please take a moment to complete the survey which has appeared on your screen. We thank you in advance for your feedback and wish you a great, great afternoon.